Hi, and welcome to the Crowdsourcing Sustainability Podcast. My name is Michaela. And I'm Ryan. And we're your co-hosts. This podcast exists to help inform, inspire, and empower people to take action on climate. We'll do this by bringing on wonderful sustainability leaders, listening to their stories, and exploring meaningful actions we can all take. So for those of you who've been following the crowdsourcing sustainability newsletter from the beginning, you may know that I'm a climate activist. I've done lobby days with Citizens Climate Lobby, been trained by the Climate Reality Project to give climate presentations. I got arrested for peacefully protesting at a sit-in in in the halls of Congress with the Sunrise Movement in 2018. And most recently, I've been active in my local chapter of the Extinction Rebellion, also known as XR. What follows is a conversation between myself and a fellow Extinction Rebellion activist and friend, Nadia Colburn. We recorded this in May 2020, setting out to cover the similarities and differences between the coronavirus and the climate crisis, because we'd both just written articles on the topic. But we also dive into a wide range of interesting topics such as humanity's relationship with nature, the culture of climate silence, forces fighting against climate action, how climate solutions are human health solutions, the importance of this moment in time, and the most impactful climate actions you can take. All right, on with the show, and I hope you end up enjoying our conversation as much as I did. So, Nadia, I know you wrote an article at least a few weeks ago now comparing the coronavirus to climate activism and kind of finding those similarities between the two. I think that'd be a great jumping-off point Uh, for this discussion. So I'd love to hear more about that in in detail and what that was all about. Yeah, so at the beginning of um, the pandemic here in Massachusetts, when it was really clear it was going to have a really big impact on everyone's lives, uh, I wrote an article suggesting the ways in which uh, climate activists could really help us understand how to deal with this crisis of the pandemic, and then how the pandemic can also help us prepare for future climate and ecological crises down the road. Uh, So I used the uh, four demands of Extinction Rebellion, which are one, to tell the truth. If we don't tell the truth, then we cannot address the crisis. And the truth uh, often is inconvenient, but we can't deal with any problem if we're not really looking it in the face. And often that means we have to listen to the experts Mm -hmm. um, and really discern carefully what it is that that they're saying and look at the whole truth. Number two is uh, act now. Had China, for example, told the truth and acted immediately, then the pandemic could have been controlled faster. Now I'm not blaming like the Chinese, but the Chinese government is an authoritarian government that doesn't like to deal with inconvenient truth. And governments, not only China, but the U.S. government, very much so, doesn't like to deal with inconvenient truths. And that leads us to a lot, a lot of problems. So we have to act now. We can't wait. And I think we'll talk about that more because it's a little bit different for the pandemic and for the climate crisis. Um, Three is uh, beyond politics and We've seen with the pandemic how polarized different positions are, and it makes it really hard to tell the truth and really see the nuances of a situation if two sides get entrenched and can't come together to see the complexity and work together. So this isn't a political issue. It is a a matter of truth and working towards a healthier, better, safer future. Um, And... In the U.S., the fourth demand of Extinction Rebellion is just transition because there's so much inequity that it's absolutely essential that we protect the most vulnerable. And all of our planning is done in a way that takes into account how everything we do will affect the most vulnerable. And we've seen in New York City in particular, I was just looking at the numbers really recently, um, the death rates for uh, people of color is like at least twice and often it's more. I think it's like um, two and a half on average. Yes. Yeah. Times. 
So that's really illustrating the systemic inequity of our society, as so many things about this pandemic are, and uh, we have to address them as we are planning for our future. Um, yeah. And so those are the four demands of Extinction Rebellion, and I think they're just super, super helpful to think about how to address a pandemic or any crisis. And then the fifth kind of ask or um, vision is to build a regenerative culture. And mm -hmm. it's really that regenerative culture vision that I think is most exciting. And actually, Ryan, you said something that really interested me, which was I was talking about the, diff the similarities between coronavirus and the climate and ecological crisis. And you said, well, there are these really big differences too. And I think it's related to that regenerative culture. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of those differences. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, first though, I just wanna say, I think that framework is super useful as a, a land for viewing this and seeing what's, got, what's gone wrong, what we could do better and how to approach these kinds of issues next time because there are so many similarities between the two. And like the, the very first thing you said was telling the truth. And if we can get better at as a society in listening to the science, which is our best tool at our disposal for finding truth, and kind of act from a common set of facts, like so much else kind of falls into place. That's a whole different discussion. But anyway, there's, there's a lot uh, in those four or five points you made that I think are worth diving into. Um, but yeah, in terms of differences, there's a few that stick out, but I think the biggest one is also the most important one. And that's just, for people to understand that climate and corona are different in that to address coronavirus, we're all sacrificing and we should be. I mean, we are prioritizing people and life and well-being, but it's not, we're, we're paying a, a cost to do that in terms of, you know, staying home, being away from our loved ones and that social distancing, like it's not, it's it's not fun. It's not ideal. Um, you're going to say something? Yeah, and I think the economic cost also, this is one of the areas where it's been politicized, but people mm -hmm. are really, really struggling financially. And I just want yeah. to you know, acknowledge that too. And they yeah. not, it's, it has real life consequences. Yeah. There's so much suffering. People are losing their jobs in droves, tens of millions. Um, and then you look on the flip side for climate action. If we are going to solve climate change, what does that look like? What does that mean? And you see that this is just a win, win, win all around. Um, it's gonna improve people's health. We're gonna have to come together and work together to solve this. And just overall, it's making our lives better, not worse. We need, we need literally millions of people to solve this problem. And in a way it really is the, I mean, I'm obviously biased, we're, we're gonna talk about this uh, more in depth, but it is this solution just sitting in our back pocket to get us out of this coronavirus mess. And not only to get us out of the mess, but to solve the next enormous looming problem at the same time. Put people to work, improve our health, and make society more resilient. Yeah. Um Absolutely. There's a really exciting report that the Sierra Club just put out saying that it has a plan to create 9 million new jobs per year for at least the next seven years in wow. infrastructure. And uh, so where coronavirus is making us lose jobs, investing in green energy, investing in our future is a job builder. And it builds better jobs. Mm -hmm. People okay, they can't work in mines anymore, but that is a very painful, difficult, dangerous job with a very poor quality of life. We can create better jobs for people across the board um, in all kinds of really interesting areas. So I think that's really very, very exciting. Um, and you were talking about- And that, that's an important part of the solution too taking care of these workers and these industries, 
uh, who are working in fossil fuels and making sure that they have a just transition to work in this cleaner economy or in whatever jobs they'd like to find. But just yeah. like really centering people uh, in this transformation because there is going to be a lot of disruption and it's for the best. But you need to be mindful uh, when these changes happen to take care of everyone along the way. Exactly. I think there's often a perception that caring for the environment is caring for like polar bears. Mm -hmm. And hey, I care about polar bears. I mean, it's actually incredibly tragic to imagine that, you know, the world I grew up in, polar bears, it never would have crossed my mind that we'd be talking about the extinction of so many, so many species. This is very essential. Um, but there isn't a separation between the animals and the people. We have to, this is about people. This is about people's lives. It's about investing in a livable world for people. Mm -hmm. And there's no separation between the environment we live in and ourselves, our health, our well being, and our ability to survive. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That I feel like we so often, especially, in higher income countries take for granted like the basic foundations of society which are like food water a safe place to live and climate change the climate emergency is threatening each one of those things uh and so it's really just this fundamental idea that we are completely dependent on nature and a part of it not separate from and better than it. Yeah. So like really coding that into our laws and our society and the way we live so that we are in harmony with our world that we depend on instead of just, you know, destroying it and thus hurt, only hurting ourselves. Yeah, there's such a weird paradox in American culture around the idea of nature. I mean... There's so much to say about that, but, um, you know, even what is nature and what is wilderness and our, our love as Americans of nature and our fear of nature, right? I mean, Betsy DeVos says, okay, we can have guns in schools so we can kill bears. Like, what a weird co country this is. Um, but there's this love and fear of nature that we have in America of like wilderness and wildness. But there's this strange paradox that's going on now because actually nature is, we can live in harmony with it. And I think that we forget that in the US, right? We've forgotten that, which are, are um, really indigenous people here, like Native Americans knew yep. that. Yep. And we had to, like the national identity was in opposition to native identity so that harmony that people had here for thousands and thousands of years got disrupted and a whole different mindset came in um, but there's this strange paradox now where we're neither able to see the ways in which we're able to live in harmony with nature but also strangely our kind of cultural imagination of how powerful and dangerous nature can be also seems to be partly forgotten, mm -hmm. at least by certain, like, certain parts of our culture, especially ones in the White House now, right? Because the other day there was just high winds here. And I was like, wow, this is really powerful. I hope my house is going to be okay. Yeah. You know, there could be a storm and it could come through and goodbye New York City. Yeah. And, and that's, there's harmony and there's also just the force of nature. And we need to get back to harmony so that we can protect ourselves mm -hmm. from nature really unleashing her enormous, overwhelming force that is going to be so much more disruptive. Yeah. Than, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. I do think, though, building on that, that the coronavirus is revealing, is opening our eyes, at least some people's eyes, for the first time that 
everything is much more fragile than we like to believe. We are not invincible as people or as a society. And we're really at the mercy of nature at certain times when it gets going. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, it's a weird analogy, but it's kind of like uh, when you're growing up, you think everything, or I had this for a while living in a bubble. Like everything's under control. Like this is, they're the best. Uh, and you have that realization that your parents are just people at some point. And then you have the same realization with society at another point. And that's like, oh, no one actually knows what they're doing. No one knows what's going on. This whole thing is not under control or necessarily moving in the right direction. And you have to be an active participant in it to try to help shape it. Um, yeah. And I think that this pandemic is kind of waking some people up to some of those realizations or a reminder, if you've already had them, to be like, these physical forces are completely out of our control at times. And if you don't figure them out, you're at the mercy of, of them, really. And with yeah. Corona, it's really bad. And with climate, especially with the path we're on, it's going to be way way worse so uh yeah yeah and so the most we can do is to be proactive and try to take care of ourselves and take care of our earth um and it's just like this is a wake-up call right you think you're going along nothing changes and all of a sudden boom <laughs> i mean here my husband's a high school teacher he was kind of waiting but he went to school one day and then five o'clock, you can't come back the next day. Mm -hmm. And that's it for the entire rest of the school year. Suddenly, so quickly things change. Yeah. So if we can, you know, prepare beforehand, I think the illusion that things are just going to keep on going in the same way mm -hmm. has been for many people uh, disrupted by this pandemic. Yeah. And so if we can really be wise and think, okay, this is a reset. How can we use this moment to create a more resilient future? Because we've seen that really we don't as a society have things set up for a rainy day. And that's an expression that people use, right? But we're going to get not just rains, but storms, <laughs> droughts, yeah. you know, floods, a, a lot of... <laughs> A lot of disruption and how do we both mitigate that you know when we can talk about specifically mm -hmm. what we need to do with carbon dioxide which the scientists have been telling us and telling us and telling us and telling us and also how do we prepare our culture to make those transitions yeah yeah uh, I have a couple of thoughts there's there's so much here <laughs> no. One is just on the, the water and flooding front. I think, I, I'll have to double check this, but Michigan just had a couple dams break or at least one dam break and thousands of people had to evacuate. And this is mid coronavirus. So you have these compounding crises stacking up on top of each other. We're just, we're really not ready for it at all. But the other part of that is that the month of April was like one of, if not the most precipitation that Michigan has gotten in, you know, X period of time. It's, it's, everything is moving at this accelerating exponential pace. And we really do need to get ahead of it because prevention is always going to be better, safer, and cheaper than, you know, waiting it out and trying to react and adapt and just like flail. Um, there's actually... Last thing here, there's this really good quote uh, from Kim Cobb, but she's talking about Corona and climate change. And she says, both demand early and aggressive action to minimize loss. Only in hindsight will we really understand what we gambled on and what we lost by not acting early enough. Yeah. And like, you can see that right now with coronavirus and you're gonna be able to see it. It's only gonna be magnified with climate change, which is an era. Like this is like a whole 21st century problem. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that's scary is, um, you know, I've had friends who seem very, very healthy be diagnosed with late stage cancer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes you can feel healthy and look healthy, feel like you're going along just fine. And then all of a sudden, when you start to get symptoms, it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to blame people. They didn't know, right? Like, they didn't know that they had cancer growing inside their bodies. But I think you can blame our society for not acting because we've gotten the diagnosis again and again and again and again. And then people are saying, well, I feel healthy. I mean, I have plenty of friends who feel 100% healthy when they get their cancer diagnosis. But they do not say, I feel totally healthy. I'm going to just go about my life exactly the way I was going about it before. At mm -hmm. least not my friends. They do something about it. Yep. And that's the situation we're in now. I mean, we're no longer at that stage, actually, where we are not seeing symptoms. As you just said, record-breaking heat, record-breaking precipitation, yeah. record-breaking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of us now in our common perception are seeing signs all around us of the changing climate and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need to just trust the experts anymore. Like we can see we ourselves, can see but we need to make that connection and act the way we would act. Not only ourselves, maybe we wouldn't take care of ourselves, but if our child was diagnosed with cancer, what would we do? She yeah. could be running around acting happy, but we would want to give her some treatment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the thing that is really frustrating is that we got this diagnosis on climate change decades ago. Uh, I know that James Hansen testified in front of Congress in 1988 I was born in 1991, and it's really just maddening and confusing. And I feel like young people especially get completely overwhelmed by this. They're just like, what happened here, everyone? Like, everyone's treating us like it's a normal thing, just going about your day, but you're completely, there's this intergenerational injustice that has happened and is continuing to happen until we act. And this is why you see so many young people leading on this. And thank goodness for it because they're, we're starting to wake other people up to the reality, the truth, the science, like we talked about earlier, of what's going on here. Like we, we've had the diagnosis, like you said. It's time we act. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm so grateful to, I'm older than you are. <laughs> um, I was born in 1972. So in 1988, I was 16. Um, and it, it hadn't trickled down. Like I, I hadn't heard of climate change when I was 16. Mm -hmm. um, I had heard of Earth Day. Um, but, you know, I think Earth Day, actually, the first Earth Day was right, right around when I was, uh, I think it was in the early 70s. Um, yeah. But but actually, it was hearing Greta Thunberg talk, I think it was at her speech at Davos, mm -hmm. um, January of, I guess it was 2019. And it was my son who said, hey, have you seen this young girl talking? Superstar. And yeah. So it was actually, you know, the younger generation and, and Greta th said, what have all the adults been doing my whole life? And I listened to it. I was like, I am one of those adults. What have I been doing my whole life? Okay, I feel bad about that. But now I have to do something. Yeah. I mean, I had done some climate activism and was thinking about the um, environment, but I hadn't really firmly said, I'm going to really put this Clinton Center in my life and mm -hmm. be more outspoken about it. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to say that my kids, my son and my daughter, are both also really pretty involved now and in climate and 
environmental um, and social justice activism. And uh, I feel like I'm following their lead to some extent. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah, I honestly, so I similarly, I guess maybe not similarly, but I don't think I heard about climate change until I was 20. And if I did, it did not register at all. And I think that speaks to some of what you were saying, which is just culturally, it seems like anyway, it, it just wasn't a big deal. It wasn't talked about. That's why we have this climate silence uh, term. But it's the kind of thing where if no one's talking about it, no one perceives it to be a big deal. It doesn't matter or it's not a threat. And it feels like we've finally, finally, finally reached some sort of tipping point on climate. Um, and it's both exciting that we're there, infuriating that it took this long, but also just like this moment and this next day, month, year, five years, decade is so critically important. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're finally at a point where there is some reason, starting to be some reason for hope. Because if you just if you went back a year or two and told us we're going to be where we are now on climate and the energy and the the movement behind it, how much it's grown, I think most people in the climate space would would take that bargain. They'd be like, "You we're that far? Okay, that means our rate of change, our progression is accelerating. Let's let's build on that." Yeah, it's a really interesting moment because we have, I mean, you talked about climate silence, which I think is a really important term. Um, and it's really important that people not only hear people talking about climate and ecological crisis, but also talking about climate silence. Mm -hmm. Because um, I actually just created a whole series of videos about helping people talk about the climate and ecological crisis. Yes, you know everyone that. should go watch that. It's fantastic. Um, my main... And, and I'm also a writer and writing coach. And my main point there is you don't need to learn how to do it the right way. Any way you talk about it is mm -hmm. the right way because there is a vast um, kind of, you, I think you were the one who introduced me to the term of the spiral of silence where the silence kind of snowballs mm -hmm. around an uncomfortable issue. So people feel uncomfortable and it's very convenient for the fossil fuel industry. So, and the fossil fuel industry has spent at least $1 billion since the Paris Agreement only a few years ago yeah. in misinformation about climate. So we are battling that enormous force against us to try mm -hmm. to keep us silent. And we've seen in the White House now, literally censorship to the Environmental Protection Agency yeah scientists even trying to censor and keep silent the truth. So that's going back to Extinction Rebellion's first demand. We have mm -hmm. to tell the truth. Silence is always, always dangerous. So every time we talk about it, we are taking a really important step. Um, and of course, there's an election coming up. And mm -hmm. that is so important. Another way we have the powers that be want to silence us is to keep us from voting yeah. and to keep us thinking that our vote doesn't matter and that both parties are roughly equally unbelievable and we're disillusioned with them both at equal rates and so we just don't vote. Well, if you care about the environment, probably people do if they're listening to this and probably you agree with me. So. I'm not trying to necessarily convince people who are listening, but I just feel so strongly about this. Um, you know, the Trump administration has uh, used their powers to roll back hundreds of environmental um, legislations and protections. And there's a really great New York Times article about that recently. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, these, this happens silently. It's not reported on very much. Most voters don't know about it, and it has enormous, enormous impact. So um, our vote is another way in which we uh, 
we can speak and break that climate silence. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I to to echo what you were you were saying a little bit ago of, of the stories uh, and talking to people, no matter your level of understanding. Like, are we're able to reach people that we know in our networks uh, far better than pretty much anyone else. Uh, so even if you don't know all the facts, no, I mean, there's so much to know, it's impossible to expect anyone to know everything and speak to every single point eloquently. Uh, but you just have to know the basics and why it matters to you. And then you can go and talk to someone. And it might be a little scary, but you do it a couple of times and you realize it's no big deal. And also, uh, you realize that people, the, 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 the surveys on behaviors and beliefs on global warming in the US show that over 70% of people believe this is happening and another two thirds or 70% care about this. So even though there's a silence, chances are when you bring it up to someone, they're going to agree and maybe secretly be happy that you voice this because people are concerned. And I think tying it back into politics, I would love for this to be made a bigger issue in the media, especially. I, I really don't think mainstream media does this issue justice at all. Um, but it's a winning issue. It is a winning issue. And if you look at the popularity of renewable energy and even the Green New Deal, even after the Fox News barrage against it, those are very, very popular uh, policies. People want to see this stuff, and especially younger people. And if we push on climate, then I think that's a winning strategy, especially when you tie it into healthcare. Climate solutions are a form of healthcare. Uh, there's somewhere between 50,000 and 250,000 people dying a year from air pollution in the US. That's massive. Happens every year. Uh, like 4.5 or I, in, in that range, I think that's a low estimate of a million people around the world. Globally, yeah. It's like Global, four, four and a half to, I want to say eight and a half. It's insane. Yes. Yes, um, and, and it's interesting that we're talking about this when we have the coronavirus because they're mm -hmm. both things that affect the lungs and then the whole system. Yep. So it's, we have to be healthier. And also the people who are most um, vulnerable to coronavirus are people who have yeah. uh, you know, already compromised lungs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think... I think there's a lot to be done in talking about and educating people on the fact that climate solutions are human health solutions. The, the World Health Organization has said that climate change is the biggest crisis for human health of the 21st century. Like this isn't like fringe ideas or niche things. Like this is, this is everywhere. We just need to internalize it and act on it. And also I've, I wish we would hammer home a bit, or by we, I mean the media, um, that, like you said, the Trump administration has rolled back 100 plus regulations and they're, they're rolling back even more right now in the middle of a health crisis. They're making people's health worse as, as this pandemic is killing people and killing people at higher rates if you have pre-existing conditions. So it's just, it's just madness. Yeah. I, I heard recently um, a metaphor that I want to share. Also, maybe yeah. because I'm a poet, but, um, mm -hmm. or simile, I guess. Uh, so this is from uh, Christiana Figueres. Uh, I'm not nice. saying her name properly. But um, so because I think there's, everything is so interconnected that it can be hard to understand the basics. Mm -hmm. um, so she used an image of a bathtub. And our world, our atmosphere is like a bathtub. And it can only take so much CO2. And it's been filling up and filling up and filling up. 
and now we're really, really close to the top and it's about to spill over. And I've had water damage in my house. It does a lot of damage. It's not something you want. Um, but this is gonna spill over and it's gonna create worse than water damage. Um, and so the idea is to stop it, we need to turn off the faucet so that more CO2 is not going into the bathtub, which mm -hmm. means stopping all fossil fuel. And we need to open the drain, which means planting trees, conserving, even more important than planting trees, conserving the trees, the wetlands, the waters that we already have, that regenerative culture that we've been talking yeah. about for the natural environment and for yeah. people's jobs, investing in those things for a healthier world and healthier people. And I feel like sometimes, even for me, sometimes it's like, it's so confusing because there's water, there's droughts, there's lungs, there's air, there's like, how do I understand it all? And I just like that. Um, I like that image because it's pretty simple. Like everything else is connected to that basic setup. Yeah. yeah. That's super, super useful. I hope, I hope people reuse that in their next conversation uh, when talking about this. Um, another, another hugely important thing, which I don't think gets enough airtime, is even just like in the climate space, uh, is like carbon farming, regenerative agriculture. That's a yeah. huge carbon sink. Uh, if we get our soils working for us, and it also is a win-win like so many other solutions because it'll make our food healthier. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So to tie this, tie us back into the big beginning of the convo uh, of how these are win-win solutions, we could do a whole nother thing on the Green New Deal or Green New Deal-like policies because we have the answers. They're here they're ready. Uh, we just need the, the power. We need to build this power to make the changes happen. And crucially, like you said, centering it on justice and really putting people at the forefront of this transition. Yeah. And, and this, just even to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation even more, this coronavirus pandemic is a time of reset, a time when we're seeing how... Yeah. Uh, you know, vulnerable our society is. Mm -hmm. We're just seeing an even more relief, the inequity and the unhealth. And we are going to, we are going to need to start up again. And so yeah. it's an opportunity to put into place um, really green, healthy, justice-oriented mm -hmm. solutions for a healthy, safe, just, equitable future for everybody. Yeah, yeah I, that is a huge, huge point. Uh, there's going to be trillions, there's already been trillions of dollars dumped into the economy. There's going to be trillions, trillions of dollars more in recovery to reboot the economy. And we need to do everything we can right now to make sure that is a green stimulus. Because not only is it crucial for climate change, but it's also there's this recent study that came out of Oxford. They surveyed like a couple hundred of the top financial people around the world, academics, uh, banks, investors, you name it. And they said that a lot of the top stimulus policy options were green. They were low carbon options. So again, this is like a win-win, critically important right now. And we need to start talking about this stuff more. So can we leave people maybe with just a few little action steps that they can do or that they can share with uh, their community for what to do around this? So how can we um, leverage this message? What, what can people do? Yeah, so I've actually done some research of my own on this before. And by that, I just mean I reached out to like, 50 experts in the climate sustainability sphere and heard back from, you know, like 16 or 17. Uh, and basically what they all said as the most effective thing that people can do boils down into a few buckets. Um, educating yourself, 
talking about this issue with friends and family, like we were talking about earlier, voting, huge, huge, huge election coming up in the U.S. and I'm sure in many other places around the world. Um, similarly, calling your representative, like we were just saying, this is a moment, like we're not going to get this kind of amount of money pumped into the economy again. And we need to make sure that goes to the right places. So calling your reps, letting them know what you want, why you want it. Um, you can throw in the Green New Deal if you'd like. And then potentially the most powerful, in my opinion, uh, especially when we can go and be together again, is to organize with other people, um, to work with each other towards that systemic change. And I definitely like to plug XR. Um, I also like Sunrise. There's, there's, I mean, Fridays for Future. There's so many movements out there. I would just encourage people to learn about them and find the one that's the best fit for them. Yeah. If, yeah, if you're not already involved in one of those groups, there's so many ways to get involved. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really crucial that uh, we stand together and show people how, um, you know, important these issues are to us because representatives listen. They're supposed to. They're, their job is to listen to the people. And I saw, you know, recently um, that uh, there's a Sanders Biden climate task force, which I yeah. was really encouraged to see. And that is because um, Sunrise, which represents the, I mean, partly because I'm sure there are lots of other things, but partly because Sunrise, which represents the younger generation, uh, and Biden really needs that vote, yep. uh, care so much about this issue. So that is just so, to me, encouraging that people, because they have come out to the streets and said, this matters to us, politicians are paying attention. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's super important to register to vote, to know your rights uh, in terms of absentee ballots, because who knows how easy it's going to be to get to the polls in November. So most states uh, allow people to register um, and vote with an absentee ballot. So uh, and, you know, telling friends and family. So all of this is so important. Um, and Ryan, you have an amazing uh, Crowdcast Solutions uh newsletter and community also with which has great resources for people who want to get more involved so. yeah yeah i can definitely throw a link to my email or crowdsourcing sustainability if anyone wants to chat and i'm sure you can do the same if anyone wants to follow up on this yeah that's great so that is the end of our show thank you so much for joining us today if you enjoyed this conversation, you may also appreciate signing up for the crowdsourcing sustainability newsletter that I write most weeks. This will also give you access to our CS Slack community. And there's a link to that in the show notes, along with several other links we referred to today. Lastly, please do consider giving us a review to help us grow this community and get this information out to more people. We would really, really appreciate that. And I think that is all we've got for you today. So Thank you again. Take care and we'll talk to you soon. And we'll talk to you soon. And we'll talk to you soon. And we'll talk to you soon.